everyone. Um, yes, in the sciences, we really like our team science approaches, even in our presentations. So um, Madison and I are going to take turns um, going back and forth. Really, we're going to be talking about positive youth development and technology, um, how we might develop character in adolescence in the present technological landscape. And so we're going to start, this is much more kind of applied and less of a philosophical conversation um, this afternoon. Um, start by talking about some of the realities teens have, um, some of the things we've tried to do as psychologists, and then we will engage some missiological reflections about our, that have really come out of our work. So I'm going to let Madison get started for us. So we are going to go ahead and start by talking about the current landscape for teens. So the focus of our work largely is with adolescents. And what is what does the tech landscape look like for adolescents these days? So here are just a few stats. 95% of teens um, have access to a smartphone and 45% say that they are online almost constantly. Um, and then also we have other stats that tell us that adolescents use media nine hours a day on average. So that's a lot. That's almost as much as people are sleeping, um, hopefully. And um, just a few other stats to kind of set the stage. We know that um, adolescent males oftentimes on average will spend about 56 minutes per day um, playing video games, whereas adolescent girls spend um, on average about an hour and a half every day on social media. And the other thing that we know is that this isn't limited to the United States. There are other countries in which people's uh, or adolescents' tech use is also quite high. So looking at South Korea, for example, almost 96% of people or of adolescents have access to a smartphone. So the, uh, the number of hours and the number of adolescents that have access to smartphones is huge. And so that is very interesting to us as psychologists because this um, is something that teens are engaging in at a really, um, in really high numbers. So I think uh, people have discussed uh, today is there a reason to uh, feel a sense of doom and gloom about technology use, since it is so much, especially for adolescents? And I'll give you the bad news first. Um, in some senses, technology has been associated with, uh, in, and social media specifically, has been associated with increased envy, anxiety, and narcissism. And we also know that researchers have found that playing video games has increased uh, aggression. And so... And in, in addition to those things, there is even a study in which researchers found that just the presence of a cell phone in the room decreased emotional intelligence and empathic abilities. Um, so those things are not so great. <laughs> but we do think that there is the possibility of an opportunity here um, because there are potential benefits and we are really interested in finding productive ways to counter some of these negative trends and that there's an opportunity for positive youth development. So, and of course, the other very big point is that these technologies are not going away. In fact, who knows, they will likely probably increase. So, in terms of missiological significance, which um, is the subject of this conference, we are really trying to trying to understand how we um, can really persuade adolescents to uh, to to be in the technological space and develop their spiritual and religious identities, and um, and so that's something that's very important to us, especially when we're talking about character strengths. So the focus of our work is really on character strengths and virtue formation. So our big question, how might digital technology enhance the religious and spiritual lives of young people? And I also wanted to really quickly talk about the positives and the opportunities that technology presents. And so first of all, there's this personalization element to technology. So that means uh, not only are perhaps your ads personalized, which maybe might be good, might not be so good, but personalization can also lead to adaptive learning environments so that adolescents um, can better learn. Um, also, technology connects people. And so on the perhaps less um, 
the less good side of things. Uh, we see bullying, we see um, we see harassment online, but also technology connects people in ways that can be deep. Um, and we think that that is an opportunity as well. And then last but not least, there's this idea of mass dissemination of information. So really quickly, lots of people can have access to lots of information. And um, as psychologists who we love collecting data, that is very exciting to us too. So as I said before, the main focus of our research is really on virtue formation. And so this is something that is continuing to uh, be popular, especially after N.T. Wright wrote a book um, called After You Believe, Why Christian Character Matters. We very much as both um, as Christians and as psychologists believe that character matters. And when we talk about character formation, people times off people oftentimes ask me, what is that? What, what does it mean to develop virtue? And so in this particular instance, we're looking at the creation of adaptive habits, and we're also looking at this idea of a transcendent narrative identity. And what that means is um, a, an identity grounded in something larger than the self. So both of these ideas are really important to us, especially within a technological and a church context, um, because we really think in church communities, they have a really great way of connecting youth, especially to a transcendent sense of narrative identity through faith. And so we think they do that really well. Um, however, uh, the thing that perhaps is not as well supported in those environments is this idea of forming new habits and replacing old ones. And the reason for that is probably because it's really hard. It actually takes, um, you know, researchers have found that it takes between 18 and 254 days um, to form a simple habit. So that's like running before dinner, or maybe not before dinner, maybe running early in the morning, <laughs> um, or eating a piece of fruit with lunch. And so those types of habits take a long time to form. And then the other thing working against uh, this sense of habit formation is the fact that many evangelical um, institutions have actually abandoned a lot of the habit formation practices that have been really helpful in the past. So fasting, for instance, isn't practiced as often in evangelical communities. And so we really think there's an opportunity here to bridge the gap with technology in the formation of these adaptive habits combined with a focus on transcendent narrative identity. So I also, uh, as I said before, there's some challenges and we're very aware of these challenges um, in the technological realm. So um, in addition to preventing or um, decreasing uh, bad outcomes, we also want to look at how do we create a positive user experience, especially as psychologists where we aren't as, um, we aren't trained as much in how to make something a positive user experience. <laughs> Um, we also want to avoid some of the pitfalls of gamification because these can actually foster addictive behaviors and undermine some of that intrinsic motivation to form good habits. And then we also want to avoid the pitfalls of social media, um, as, as we sort of focused on before. Uh, this increase in self-focus and comparison can lead to things like anxiety and envy um, and also promote gossip and relational aggression, which we, we, don't, we don't want. And we also want to think about um, how teens are thinking about the effects of social media. And we think it's really interesting that they, um, they actually have a sense of the challenges and the opportunities of social media. So what you're looking at here, it's a Pew Research Center poll. And um, so they're among the teens who said that it was mostly positive. Um, they actually said that the most positive aspects of it were connecting with friends and family with that 40% up there. And then the mostly negative side of technology, they were saying was associated with bullying and rumor spreading. And so they're is very clearly both, you know, as practitioners and psychologists, we understand that there are positive and negative aspects and the teens understand this as well. And so we really are interested in moving towards solutions. So I've outlined some of the challenges, but we also, in order to create solutions that work, we really have looked to interdisciplinary teams to better understand um, how we can create, um, in this case, a product that is really helpful and it works. Um, and I think also understanding from a theological sense, as we'll discuss here, what that actually means. And so we have created partnerships um, and you'll hear more 
more about our specific project, but these partnerships uh, have been between technology designers, developers, um, practical theologians, and missiologists. And we think there's great potential for even more of those, um, those partnerships to really make an impact. And so Sarah is going to tell you a little bit more about a case study. Excellent. Thank you, Madison. Um, right. I think it's one thing to hear about, OK, these are the challenges. Here are things in the abstract. Um, but quite another to say, what would this look like in the real world? How can we actually form a partnership, do this, and try to actually cultivate a virtue in adolescence? Um, it's one thing to talk about it, but it's another thing with boots on the ground trying to make it happen. And so what I want to share with you was some of the experiences of our team as we really tried to build um, and cultivate the virtue of patience um, using a smartphone app. So you might be wondering, why patience? What is patience? Um, it's actually quite understudied in the psychological literature um, and really came to it because it's the thing people often say is eroded by technology. Um, so I've spent much of my career looking at this uh, neglected character strength. And so patience is uh, defined as the propensity of a person to be calm in the face of frustration, adversity, or suffering. Um, it's generally associated with waiting, but it can be other forms of suffering as well. Um, the Latin root, I think, is really helpful with patience. comes from pati, which means to suffer. Um, and if you look more at the etymological roots, it's really this picture of caring or bearing under a heavy burden um, and keeping going um, and being willing to bear that burden for the sake of others, for something beyond the self. So, you know... You haven't probably heard many theologians these days talk about patience. We talk about forgiveness. We talk about gratitude, um, things like that. But patience is oft neglected. Um, and David Bailey Harned, um, late moral theologian and um, kind of philosopher, talked about why this might be the case. And he claims that waiting and suffering are seen now as deprivations enforced upon us by an unfriendly environment. Um, that with all of the technological advances, really starting it with the Industrial Revolution, um, and now just really accelerated with our information revolution, that having patience is really seemed as childlike or a failure of nerve. We don't believe this is something we should have to have. Um, instead, that it means our technology has failed if we have to suffer or wait. Um, you know, and he also talks about that this is a false impression, um, that affluence and inventiveness, they have not really reduced our time waiting or suffering as much as changed it. Um, Right, so a recent study by Timex um, estimated that they measured how long people were waiting in their daily lives, estimated that across the lifetime, um, the average person will spend six months waiting in lines, uh, 43 days on hold with automated customer service lines, um, 27 days waiting for the bus for those who take public transport, um, and it goes on and on, right? So our waiting has just changed. Um, even in our age of instant gratification, they're still suffering. Um, and I think even kind of some of the stats that uh, Madison was presenting earlier and that we've talked about today, that with this iGen, right, there's higher levels of anxiety, depression. Our psychological suffering, if anything, um, might be on the rise. Right, and so it seems imperative to me that we develop patience now <laughs> or happiness now, right? Um, but that we really need to consider this virtue as part of our Christian formation and as a way to love our neighbor, um, that it's really essential for that. Um, because, right, most of what we offer in psychology, at least in pop psych, not in kind of the true psychological practice, but pop psych says, Five easy steps, boom, boom, boom. Like you can fix your life, you can grow spiritually. Easy peasy, just do this small formula. But as my clinical colleagues will tell you, um, and anyone who's dealt with major um, concerns in life, nothing is that simple. Um, and growth and development and spiritual formation really do take time. 
And so it was really wonderful when I was here at Fuller getting to work with Bill Durness a bit, thinking about uh, how our scriptures talk about the virtue of patience um, and seeing that there's really uh, two different conceptualizations um, in the New Testament in particular. Um, the first is really of a passive experience of enduring suffering. Um, we don't like to talk about this component of patience very much, really exemplified in God's long suffering um, on the cross and really bearing the suffering for the sake of others, um, not resisting it. Um, the second form is more of an active expression, right? A lot of us are a little bit more comfortable with this form, um, staying steadfast, um, keeping forward, persevering um, despite the circumstances, um, and that that's a little bit more active and maybe what we like, especially in Western cultures. Um, but what was really quite interesting to learn in our interdisciplinary work is that patience really with the New Testament writings was transformed from a virtue that was about personal cultivation and individualism um, into a highly relational virtue by which the believer responds to the patience of God with us and then extends that patience to others. Um, it's really interesting. So in our work on patients uh, with empirical studies, um, we find that there tend to be um, different types of burdens we all must carry. Um, and that when we look at things empirically, patients seems to be classified according to those burdens. So we have um, patients with life hardships, so long-term illness, disability, um, things that you will continue to suffer throughout the lifespan. Um, we find interpersonal patients, um, I have a three-year-old, right? Dealing with that three-year-old is a daily practice of patience. Um, dealing with spouses, colleagues, um, people we encounter in daily life requires us to regulate our emotions and suffer for the sake of the other. Um, and then we also have daily hassles, which is I think what we typically think of in terms of patients of getting stuck in traffic, waiting in line, et cetera. Um, but what we find in our research is that it's those two forms of patients that I first described of life hardships and interpersonal patients that really um, seem most essential for thriving individuals and thriving communities. Um, that is the type of patients that's most predictive of well-being outcomes um, and pro-social engagement in the world. And I think those two are also quite relevant to spiritual formation um, and loving our neighbor in community, especially that interpersonal patience. So as we think about Okay, should we even try to cultivate patience with technology? Uh, there's some objections that people immediately tend to have. I mean, I think one of the most uh, interesting things to me is that as a researcher, when I talk to just everyday folks about my work and you know, I do studies on gratitude as well and generosity. When I talk about those, everyone's like, oh yes, yes, we need this. When I talk about patience, at least 50% of the time, the first thing out of someone's mouth is, oh, I don't have any of that, <laughs> right? It's the one virtue that we're allowed to not have and even carry that with pride. And I think part of the reason for that is that people view patience as passivity, as lack of assertiveness. Um, they think that patience leads to inaction. And so we've looked at this um, in our work and we find that no, patience does not lead to inaction. It is actually completely uncorrelated with assertiveness. Um, and in fact, we find that when you track people's pursuit of goals across time, patience actually facilitates higher goal effort, meaning, and satisfaction. Um, so it actually seems to energize the person and allow them to stick with a goal even when it is hard. And part of the reason for this is when you conceptualize virtues um, kind of by an Aristotelian notion, they're really thought of as the golden mean between two vices of excess and deficiency. And so when we think about patience, not only is it the opposite of recklessness or reactivity, right? So I like to think of the patient kitty cat, right? If that cat's sticking its paw in the um, hole to get the mouse, it's not gonna get there, right? It's being reactive and pushing forward too quickly. 
Um, but that cat also is not going to get very far if it falls asleep on the job <laughs> and just gives up. And so the kind of term that's been historically used as the opposite vice of patients is acedia or acedia. Um, I'm sure I have colleagues in the room who could pronounce that much better than I do, but there we go. Um, right, and this idea of sloth, um, it was often discussed um, by the monastics, this inability to love anymore, to just be so overwhelmed by the difficulty of it um, that you just disengage um, and no longer can stick with this quest to love our neighbor. And so we've done some studies, collaborators and myself, looking at can we actually increase patience in young people? Um, is this something we can cultivate through intentional exercises? And I've done some experimental studies um, where we assign people to engage in various activities um, to increase their patients. Um, and so some of our first studies um, used very much a psychoeducational approach. So um, telling people about how to regulate your emotions and telling them why that may be important and helping them kind of cultivate a reason beyond the self why this would matter. Um, and we find that this in-person intervention we gave was effective. It not only increased patients and positive emotions, but it also um, decreased depressive symptoms in undergrads. And in another study that was self-administered through kind of take-home workbooks um, that community members used, we found that um, the patient's intervention also increased communicative competence, so your ability to engage relationally. But there's some bad news as well. Um, I'm very interested in developing virtues in adolescence because I think there is a um, kind of special developmental window um, in which we have influence during this period of life. Um, and so being able to help an adolescent form a virtue might be a really powerful um, route to creating a virtuous community. Um, but what we find is that developing patience in adolescence is not as easy as it is with college students or adults. Um, right, so in one of our studies, we use the same exact exercises of teaching cognitive reappraisal, which is basically a way to regulate emotions where you change the way you're thinking about the situation, right? So, oh, this daughter of mine is so frustrating, <laughs> she's having a temper tantrum. Instead of saying, well, she has a developing brain and this is hard for her too. And I can approach this um, with empathy or with a different perspective. So this is a very well-established um, way of helping people be patient really in the psych literature. When we gave those exercises to adolescents, um, it didn't work. <laughs> they failed to increase their patients and help them regulate. Um, right, and why might this be? Self-control is still um, an, an executive function in general is really in flux in adolescence, that it's a very much a developing skill and may be particularly difficult for teenagers when it's around emotionally salient material and around understanding the minds of others and relating that back to the self. Right, so we have a challenge here. Um, that our traditional ways of providing interventions and helping adolescents aren't working, right? And so we said, huh, perhaps this would be a great place to use the tool of technology. And said that technology, talking about those affordances that Madison was discussing earlier, technology has some affordances that might provide the scaffolding that's really needed to build patience in young people. And so we practice what we preach. We said, well, perhaps we need to get an interdisciplinary team together. Um, perhaps we need to figure out a way to build a technological product um, that can really try to make a difference in the lives of real youth. Um, and so we gathered members. Matt Lumpkin um, was a great uh, designer for our team. Um, we had different types of psychologists, which actually it's quite rare and psychologists like to stick with their own kind, um, just like all human beings. So we had developmentalists, personality and social psychologists. Um, and we're just in conversations with folks and we um, reviewed the scientific literature and we started conducting focus groups um, with actual teenagers, <laughs> um, which is always wonderful. Sometimes as adults, we forget that 
we aren't teenagers anymore, even though some of us might act that way and that we're different and we need to actually talk to our um, audience that we hope to reach. Um, and so as we were having our conversations with teens, um, it became apparent that interpersonal patience was really a major um, problem for them. Of course, they didn't say it in those words. Um, and we were asking them, well, do you have conflicts that you have? And they're like, no, conflicts. What are you talking about? Um, and I remember Matt said, well, do you get in fights very often? And they're like, of course. Like <laughs> every day I get stuck in the same fight over and over with my brother. And I would really love to have a tool that could help me break the cycle and help me try something different. And we said, hmm, it seems like my technology might be a great place to come in here. All right, and so Matt, um, it was really wonderful to work with him and just to think about what do we know from psychology, but what does the user experience also demand? And so we did a real iterative process of trying to think about especially around this interpersonal patience, how could we help adolescents to have a tool they could pull out on the ground when they're having a conflict or immediately after it um, to try to process that conflict differently with other people and to build their skills to be patient with others. Right, and so I'm just gonna show you a little bit of what we created, right? So we had a couple different functions of the app but I'm gonna focus on this um, kind of fix a conflict section, right? So teens could come to it and we gave them a variety of strategies they could choose um, in that moment. And sometimes we asked them to try different ones. Um, so we had a take perspective task, which they basically, and all of these, they um, basically go choose the task. Um, they select who the conflict is with from their contacts. Um, and then they are asked to describe very briefly what's going on, right? And this is more for us to try to understand how the app is being used. And then they were given an exercise. So in this take perspective task, they were supposed to ask uh, first rate their own emotions during the conflict. And this in itself is an intervention of becoming aware of your own emotions and what they are and why you might be feeling them. Then in this task, we ask them, well, imagine you're the other person. <laughs> How do you think they're feeling right now? Um, just doing something different. And then we ask them just to reflect on that with a countdown timer um, and then go back and rate their own emotions now. Right, so we had a variety of tasks like this. We also um, had a mindfulness task that involved um, kind of just giving some education about some breathing exercises and just try it <laughs> and do it with a countdown timer. We had a selfie task where they took a picture of themselves, then did the mindfulness exercise, and then took another picture and try to notice how your facial expression has changed, um, becoming aware of those emotions. We had a listen up activity where they were asked to go find a song um, that they have to try to help themselves calm down um, or feel better. We had a think again challenge, which they really led them through that cognitive reappraisal of thinking about it differently. Um, and we designed kind of very intentionally to include some gamification elements to make it fun and kind of a similar user experience as teens are used to, but not to rely on those too heavily so that they wouldn't undermine the intrinsic motivation. Right, and so those are, those are the five um, conflict solving strategies I was just talking about. And we've tested this out now at this point with 516 high school students um, who were pretty diverse in their ethnicity in the greater LA area. Um, and we found some really interesting things. So the mindfulness and listen up tasks were the most popular and the selfie and take perspective were the least popular. The take perspective and think again were more effective um, in reducing feelings of anger, sadness, and upset, but were less effective increasing feelings of happiness. Selfie was less effective than other tasks in reducing sadness, but more effective in increasing happiness. And finally, mindfulness was less effective than other tasks in reducing upset, but more effective in increasing happiness. Um, and we could get into this, just interesting to kind of start to share, I'm not going to process these completely, but some really interesting nuanced kind of things we can start to understand. And so 
we've done some great things here, but there's still so much more to be done. Um, one of our hopes, I think, is to take this from just a personalized exercise and to really use these kind of activities to push people out to also have in-person interactions with maybe trusted mentors, teachers, um, to take what they're doing here and maybe be able to send a text <laughs> or have some kind of communication outward that might help to better scaffold even um, these strategies that youth are gaining. Um, and we need to move beyond just one type of team doing this as well. Um, so I'm really excited. So after this conference, I'm going to a conference that I'm hosting with my colleague, Ben Holberg. Um, with grantees that we've gotten, we ran an RFP, a request for proposals for technologists um, to design products um, that might build virtues in youth. And we're going to pair them with scientists and really try to get other folks and other teams trying out this kind of process um, to see if we might get something that actually sticks and that can be carried to completion. Um, but I think as we continue to do this type of work, we do need to keep those cautions in mind, um, always being aware of undermining the intrinsic motivation because doing good things and being kind actually is intrinsically motivating when you do it. Um, so we don't want to replace that um, with winning points. Um, so that's something to always be aware of. Um, and then another concern we have and thing we're actively thinking about is that character development is not just about that habit formation. It's also about building that moral identity um, and that transcendent purpose. And so thinking about how to connect um, that with the habit formation capacities of apps or other types of technologies um, and making sure we don't do one without the other. All right, I'm gonna take a break. You can stop listening to me for a few minutes and turn it back over to Madison for um, some initial missiological implications. Thank you. Okay, so we really wanted to say up front that this was a project that was designed by psychologists and by technologists. And so we are wanting right now to explore um, with you the theological assumptions that we had going into the project and also explore the missiological implications um, of those things. So first, we wanted to talk about the spirit of technology. And so... Um, I think one of our foundational, um, one of the foundational assumptions we have is that the spirit is in the world and that technology, um, in this use of technology for virtue development, we aren't simply just capitulating and saying, well, because technology is here to stay, then there's nothing we can do about it. So I guess we'll just work with it. Um, instead, I think we've taken the stance that um, the spirit is in the world and in all things and in people. And so um, one of the things that we've been thinking about quite a bit as we've worked on this project is this idea of how we can find the spirit within technological spaces. And so um, Dr. Christine Kim, I think, says it best when uh, she says that the interest today is not so much in philosophy as in the practical questions of how and where the spirit is to be discerned. If it is to be, if it is to relate to contemporary society, pneumatology must recognize the spirit's work beyond the boundaries of the church or the Christian heart. And we think that this, um, in this case study specifically, this is an area in which we can explore where is the spirit working within, um, within this technological space for adolescents. We also um, we also look to Moltmann, who uh, I'm just going to go ahead and read this because he, I think, says it best. Um, but according to the biblical traditions, all divine activity is pneumatic in its efficacy. It is always the spirit who first brings the activity of the father and the son to its goal. So it follows that the triune God also unremittingly breathes the spirit into his creation. Everything that is, exists, and lives in the unceasing inflow of the energies and potentialities of the cosmic spirit. This means that we have to understand every created reality in terms of energy, grasping it as the realized potentiality of the divine spirit. Through the energies and potentialities of the spirit, the creator is himself present in his creation. He does not merely confront it in his transcendence, entering into, entering into it, he is also imminent in it. And so 
what does this mean um, for the spirit and technology? And for us, it means that these technological developments um, and the technologically mediated interactions um, that they occasion, they can actually be concrete expressions of the spirit um, and the spirit's presence in human creatures. So whether um, it's something that humans have designed um, in our earliest days, so um, tools, uh, something hewn out of rock or, or, um, or wood. Uh, now we have these new technologies where we have smartphones and they're created, um, and those things are just as, um, just as infused with the spirit. And so we really think that in this technological space, the spirit is present. And that's something that we are going to continue considering in our exploration of technology. And Sarah's going to talk a little bit more about patience. So as we think about building especially the virtue of patience through technology, um, I think there are uh, myriad missiological implications. Um, we really love the work of Tomas Halik. <laughs> um, I don't know if many of you have read him, but I highly recommend this book, uh, The Patience with God. Right? And in it, he maintains that Christians are called to stand in patient solidarity with contemporary Zacchaeuses who remain on the sideline of Jesus's event, um, cautious but noncommittal. Right? If we really think about taking seriously the quest to love our neighbor, um, it implies a certain posture toward all of our neighbors um, that cannot be separated from what constitutes it as an act of love. Um, we find it therefore not incidental uh, that in 1 Corinthians, um, what is listed first as a requirement of love is patience. Um, that cultivating the virtue of patience is really a necessary gateway to learning to love. Um, and that it's hard to imagine um, having other forms of love or other virtues without patience first. So Halik's concern here with a loving stance towards this Zacchaeus type figure who's on the sidelines is that we draw, don't try to just draw others into the heart of the church, um, but that we broaden the heart of the church to include them, um, that we need to develop our patience um, and that we need to be an understanding neighbor for those who find it impossible um, to join those exultant crowds, um, just like Zacchaeus, um, that we find a way to broaden ourselves to be a neighbor to those who keep their distance, um, that we need the patience um, to endure people's doubts um, and expand that heart. So by framing Christian mission in this way, Halik's concern is not to draw others into the heart of the church, but to really broaden that heart to include them. Right, and so this kind of approach demands a very loving patience. Um, that's not about moving the position of the other um, from non-belief to belief, but rather to embrace the other wherever they're at, um, perhaps even indefinitely, and to have the patience to wait there with them um, and to um, be unsure um, with them. Right, so then the end result is not a conversion of the religious other, but a conversion of the Christian, <laughs> right? Who by cultivating the virtue of patience is able to mature in their faith through this newfound capacity to persevere with their doubts and carry the non-belief that the other feels in their own hearts, right? So with, to have this patient posture um, in missiology it's not principally about giving our religious or non-religious neighbors the technological means to cultivate their virtue, but first and foremost about us, um, about being and becoming a people whose love is marked by this patience, by the painstaking, long-suffering, life-giving patience um, that God gives us. 
So in addition to Halik's um, work on patients that we find really has this missiological significance, um, another point we'd like to bring forth is that patients really requires communal practice. Um, so a shout out here to uh, Warren Brown and Brad Strong um, in their book, The Physical Nature of Christian Life, um, which is another one I would highly recommend. Um, and I loved being colleagues with Warren and Brad because they always hammered home this point that it's the community, not just the individual. Right? And we see this for virtue development, especially patients and interpersonal patients. It requires socially embedded practices, especially for these adolescents. Um, you can't develop interpersonal patients without encountering a frustrating other. <laughs> That's what it requires. And luckily, if you go to church or hang out in any kind of Christian community, that will happen quickly, right? This is not hard to come by, but it does require communal involvement, um, especially for young people um, who need social scaffolding and who are really developing the skills of learning to engage with others as autonomous selves, um, yet still related. And in some ways, Christian communities are very uniquely situated um, to serve in this capacity um, that we... Despite all of our failures, um, have a way to provide a cohesive narrative um, to people who inhabit an increasingly fragmented, disconnected, and individualized reality, right? So that a Christian community can help bring us back to a communal um, way of thinking. So finally, um, beyond thinking about patients um, with others and need of community. The last missiological reflection on patients um, that I'd like to present to you all is understanding patients as Sabbath rest. Because um, there is this component of patients, though we say it doesn't necessarily lead to inaction or passivity, that does involve a stop and a wait, and perhaps not taking action immediately, or even ever, um, in some cases when that is wise. Um, and so this seems to relate quite closely to the idea of Sabbath. Um, when we look at the account um, found in the book of Deuteronomy, Sabbath keeping is connected closely to Israel's exodus from Egypt. Sabbath rest then would seem is more about than just recovering our energy <laughs> from a tiring week um, and refueling. It also has something to do with active resisting, um, active resistance of the oppressive systems and structures within which we operate. Um, sometimes when we operate in oppressive structures, we know do it willingly, but probably more often we're completely unaware of kind of the power structures we're in. And so when we resist oppressive systems and structures, um, we need a way to do that. And Sabbath helps break us out of our routine. <laughs> and remember that we are not the slaves of our technology, <laughs> but instead it's a tool given to us by God. So when we start to think about, right, people talk about a technological Sabbath or taking a break from technology, um, we want to rethink what this might mean, that it's not just a breaking from the activity, um, but a whole new way of approaching technology um, that helps us to resist the ways we're complicit um, in technological forms of injustice, right? So exploitation of information um, by companies or governments um, for immoral or materialistic ends, um, the online acts of relational aggression that are all too common. Um, so, right, so realizing our complicity, but then delighting in the ways that technology can transform, that it might heal relationships, like we are hoping um, with our app, and just finding a reorientation and a new way of viewing this tool. So in conclusion, as we think about some of our missiological um, reflections on our work um, and saying kind of what our empirical research tells us, um, we think we need not fear technology. Um, instead, we can confidently affirm uh, those technologies that help adolescents cultivate virtues like patience. Um, 
and embrace technologies that provide us new and emerging means for loving our digital neighbors um, in a digitally networked society. And I need to really uh, thank my collaborators as um, I mentioned, we do team science, we do interdisciplinary work and all these ideas, um, projects and kind of way of moving forward is very much a group effort. And so I'm very thankful to my collaborators and numerous grad students, now colleagues um, who have worked on this with us. Um, and thank you for your patience. Um, with our talk. Hopefully it was not a moment of suffering and something opposite. Um, so thank you very much. Mm -hmm.